In this video, we'll talk a little bit about water structure and its importance to body fluid uh, characteristics in all of the compartments, the cytoplasm, the interstitial space, and the plasma. And so uh, physicists often refer to structured water as what we call hydration layers. And this occurs because water has a very uh, interesting uh, molecular structure wherein oxygen, which is highly electronegative, ends up with a partial negative charge. Uh, it has a large and positive nucleus that attracts the electrons in these covalent bonds with the hydrogen uh, atoms, and therefore the electrons within those covalent bonds spend more time around the oxygen, making it uh, more negative over time because the electrons are spending less time around the single proton in the hydrogen atom here, we end up with a partial positive charge. So we end up with what's referred to as a dipole structure. This means that water is not only attracted to itself, we get another water molecule here with an oxygen with its negative charge, partial negative charge, and hydrogens. And a bit like uh, those um, barrel of monkey toys that kids have where the monkeys connect to one another, uh, the water molecules are forming these dipole attractions, uh, one to another to another. Now, normally in, let's say, a glass of water, those interactions are picosecond duration, very, very short duration. And so the water is just constantly moving around, changing its interaction uh, with other water molecules. Now, when we have a more stable substrate, down here we've got our protein in orange here, this globular protein. And some of the, the groups, some of the elements within that protein are also electronegative and therefore would attract water molecules. And the water molecules that are directly attached to uh, those electronegative elements uh, form what is known as bound water. And that bound water basically never leaves the surface of this protein. Now, keep in mind, this would also be true of membranes. Membranes have phosphate heads, the, the, uh, the end of the phospholipids that face the water uh, boundaries, uh, either the cytoplasm or the interstitial fluid for the cell membrane. But remember, organelles also have membranes. And so, but those phosphate heads would also attract and form bound water. And that bound water will not leave the surface of this protein. Now, those water molecules, I'll circle one here, would interact with another layer of water, uh, this sort of intermediate layer. This is sometimes referred to as vicinal water. And because it is associating with a water molecule that's really not moving, that water becomes more stabilized, right? And as the farther out we go, the more uh, exchange occurs with these water molecules being more likely to sort of like uh, disperse off into the what we call the, the the bulk water here right and this is bulk water like that water in a, in a glass that we have that we drink right and so what we're trying to point out here is that the water we're used to seeing in life right in a pond in a glass is bulk water but in biological scenarios we often have bound water or this intermediate layer vicinal water and that water forms what we refer, refer to as a hydrogel this is water that is structured and stays in place or largely in place due to some sort of stabilizing um, substrate, a protein or a membrane. Now, in the cytoplasm, we have cytoskeleton, we have soluble proteins that are floating around, right? So we have a lot of structured water and therefore a significant hydrogel. This is important because, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's important because a hydrogel uh, does not, that water within a hydrogel does not move osmotically. It is not water that can leave the cell. And so when we get osmotic dehydration of a cell, it's only the bulk water that can leave. Well, that's important because bulk water is required for rapid diffusion of metabolic intermediates, for instance. And so the less bulk water we have, the more we start to impinge on the normal functioning of the cell. That's why cellular dehydration creates so much dysfunction. In the interstitial space, we also have secreted proteins. We have a potential glycocalyx, um, proteins that are sort of attached to the membrane and protruding out into that interstitial space. And so we also have significant 
um, hydrogel in the interstitial space as well. This helps avoid uh, gravitational movement of water through that interstitial, interstitial space. It doesn't move because it's sort of stuck in a gel. Does it impede diffusion to a degree? Sure, but there tend to be sort of watery aqueous pathways. It's not a solid uh, gel-like structure out there. And so there are still pathways where there's free water uh, and there's not that there's no diffusion through a hydrogel, it's just impeded to some degree. If you recall uh, fixed laws of diffusion, one of the factors affecting the rate of diffusion is the viscosity of the solvent through which that substance is diffusing. And so these, uh, the fact that water is a dipole and is attracted to other polar substances creates a hydrogel in some areas that can lead to diminished osmotic movement of water and also lead to uh, diffusional problems when it's limited, uh, the, the, uh, the bulk water amount is limited due to um, osmotic dehydration, for instance. In the plasma, we don't, we have lots of plasma proteins, but their density is not high enough such that we would create uh, a significant hydrogel. Are there hydration layers around the plasma proteins? Certainly. But again, the protein density is not high enough so that we end up with a gel, which of course would be highly dysfunctional.